Yes, good afternoon. I want to make this video for the DCS two answers. Um, computer hardware and uh, repairs two. Computer hardware maintenance and repairs two. And we are focusing on the operating system. And as I were earlier introduced in the lecture, uh, we will be combining lecture and lab most of the time uh, because of the importance, because of the necessity. So I'll be sharing my screen now. I want to go through um, this. Uh, slide we'll be using. Uh, if, you are, if you are joining the meeting, just um, remain muted. And um, uh, only when you want to talk, you unmute yourself, especially when you want to ask questions. So I'll be doing this. Uh, for the next 20 or 30 minutes. So um, this is a follow up on the first lecture. So it's going to be like lecture lab uh, video. So let's just uh, take it like that. It could be lecture lab. OK. Yes, I hope you can see. I'm using the uh, Cisco Network Academy notes uh, just for the sake of the lab. It's for the sake of the lab. Um, this is going to also serve for those who want to uh go through the it essential certification in cisco network academy you can contact our it academy for that this is just to encourage us in the in the details of the uh, operating system okay uh this is what the object objectives of this presentation and lab session will be like. I want to just explain the characteristics of basic and basic functions of modern operating systems. We would like to describe and compare types of operating system, which will include their purpose, their limitations, and their compatibilities. We're going to determine operating system based on customer needs we're going to install an operating system later. It may not be in this one, but you will have a, a pre uh, a pre mm, notification or pre information, a pre or information to how to install an operating system. And by following this, you can do that on any uh, any virtual um, machine, you can install virtual machines, virtual PC, and that's the purpose. Uh, you'll be able to try to practice with virtual machines, virtual PC. We have uh, Oracle uh, virtual machines and all that. Um, VM, we have VMware, we have all this that you can install on any Windows machine uh, that has enough uh, RAM and uh, hard disk space. So now quickly, you also be able to identify and apply common presenting maintenance techniques for operating system and troubleshoot operating system. So this will be this, uh, but I won't be able to do everything in this video. So I'm, I want to limit my video to about a very short video so that I can cover a sizable number of uh, 
of um, knowledge uh, area so that you can easily digest and then you can also ask questions. Uh, so this may this slide may take up to two videos. So I will be quickly. So let's come talk to that come to the purpose of an operating system. Uh, the operating system OS controls almost all functions on a computer. This is follow is a follow up on the on the first lecture. And the first lecture deals with the theory behind the operating system. Now, this is combining both theory and practical so that you can easily uh, match the two and uh, be a bit comfortable. Uh, now, in this particular presentation, we'll be learning about the components, functions, and terminology related to Windows 7, Windows Vista, Windows XP operating system. So, uh, Windows 7, you know, we can also talk about Windows 8, Windows uh, 10. And so, uh, because this is an old slide, so don't uh, worry. We'll, we'll, whatever you can do with Windows 7, we can be extended to Windows, Windows 8, Windows 10. So they are very, very uh, close. Because right now we are using Windows 10. And um, we'll be expecting uh, more uh, functionalities. Now, let's talk about characteristics of an operating system. Characteristics of an operating system. Characteristics of an operating system. What is what are the characteristics? Number one, we have multi-user. Number two, we have multitasking. Number three, we have multi-processing. Number four, we have multi-trading. Now, these are characteristics that operating system can have and manifest. So let's talk about multi-user. We've talked about this in the previous lecture, but let's try to break it down. When you talk about multi-user operating system, talking about two or more users having individual accounts that allow them to work with programs and peripheral devices, printers, and other at the same time. Okay, two or more users having individual accounts that allow them to work with programs and peripheral devices at the same time. So, multi-user operating system, they take two or more users at the same time. Now. The same operating system can also be multitasking as well as multi-user, okay? Now, multitasking is talking about the capability of an operating system to be able to have, be able to run multiple applications at the same time. Being able to run <coughs> multiple applications at the same time, okay? You can run Notepad, Microsoft Word, PowerPoint, like on this machine, I can see it's a multitasking because I'm, I'm uh, we're actually running Windows 10 on this machine, on this laptop that we're using for the presentation. And uh, it also supports, you know, um, it supports multiprocessing and multi-trading also. But multitasking means you're able to run multiple applications. Like I'm running Zoom on this machine. I'm also running um, web browsers. Uh, we am able to get these files. I'm also, um, you know, uh, running um, PowerPoint, uh, Microsoft PowerPoint uh, slides, a PowerPoint, you know, application. And uh, I can also run Microsoft Word and uh, a host of other applications, depending on the capability of the hardware. That means if I have enough RAM, I have enough hard disk space, and uh, the processing power of the CPU can also uh, support that. Uh, because as you start multitasking, 
and running multiple applications at the same time your physical ram will be getting used up and when that happens your your system can freeze when you use up the uh physical RAM, when the physical ram is not able to support all the principles and the, or it can become slower so those are the things that uh having to do with the practical aspect multiprocessing is the operating system that can support referring to the ability of operating system to support two or more cpus so multiprocessing uh supporting two or more cpus now on this machine uh it's about it, it, it's equivalent to a core i3 uh just for the purpose of the, this presentation we have also core i5 here uh so system can support more than we have dual core uh, uh, systems. We have core i3, uh, core i5, core i7. So these are systems that can have that 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 can that can you know make available more CPUs, and so. An operating system that is able to take advantage of two or more CPUs available on the uh, motherboard, on the hardware of the computer system is referred to as a multi-processing operating system. Now let's talk about multi-threading. Multi-threading is made possible when a program runs in smaller parts and they are loaded as needed by the operating system. So a program broken into smaller parts and then they are loaded as needed by the operating system. So each thread will run when they are needed. So multi-threading allows individual programs to be even multitasked. So that is the summary. Like word processing, Microsoft Word can have multi threads and they can now allow uh, each program to be multitask. Okay. Now, basic function of an operating system all computers rely on an operating system to provide the interface for interaction between users, applications, and hardware. We talk about that, user uh, interface. Now, the next function is that the operating system allows, uh, system, uh, allows the computer to boot. It also manage the file system. Talk about file management, okay? Uh, operating system has four main roles. Number one, control hardware access, manage files and folders, provide user interface, and then manage applications. In the previous uh, lecture, we talked about security. We talked about uh, user management also. So now let's talk about processor and architecture. We have 32-bit window operating system and X, 86 processor architecture. Now, in this in this um, scenario, you have a 32 bit operating system. We're talking about x86 processor. Now, when we talk about x86, x can refer to any number from three, four, five, six. Now we have three, eight, six. In fact, earlier we have 286, to be very precise, to be very um, uh, down to heart. Uh, we, we can start even from 186, because we have the first processor uh, that became popular as 8086. And that means that there's an imaginary 186. So later we have 8286. Later we have 8386. Later we have 8486. And now we now begin to drop the 80 <clears throat> when we begin to use 
um, 486, 586, and then 686 uh, before those uh, were, were, were dropped. So all those are 32 bits uh, operating system and they later can support 64 bit uh, now we have 32 bit windows system and x86 processor architecture they're capable of addressing four gigabytes of ram They have, um, I mean, we have X86 that are using complex instruction set computer. And that is the instruction set they are using. We have we have complex instruction set compute computing. Okay, and that's instruction set. We also have um, we have uh, uh, reduced instruction set computing so you have s you have cics six six then we have risk in in the in the category of instruction set we have complex instruction set computing then we have reduced instruction set computing now x86 uses that and then x86 processor are fewer they use fewer registers than x64 processors so take note of that. Now, 64-bit operating system, 64-bit Windows operating system, and x64 processor architecture. Uh, processor actually refer to the hardware, while the operating system refer to the software. So, and as I earlier said, they work hand in hand. So, operating system must be able to work with the hardware architecture. That is the processor architecture. Now. 64 bit operating system uh, and x64 processor architecture. Now, they're capable of addressing 128 plus gigabyte, gigabyte, uh, gigabyte of RAM. Now, they have enhanced performance for memory management, they have additional security features x64 architecture is backward compatible with x86 and if you say which one is higher and the fact that you see 86 and 64 can deceive you if you want to use the uh the numeric you know interpretation if you say is the figure figure 86 is higher in nomenclature than 64 but in this we're talking about uh, 64 bit being able to process 64 uh you know uh line of uh, of 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 instruction or 64 bits of instruction at the same time what are the two bits is able to process 32 bit of instruction at the same time uh if you look at uh, uh you know parallel processing like you have, um, you have uh, 32 wires or 32 bit, and you have 64 wires at 64 bit. So it's it, it's just very. It's it's it, it it can be explained that if you have 32 wires carrying information, and you have 64 wires carrying information or carrying data, and so it would be easy to send, you know. Uh, 64 you know bits as they go on 64 bits uh wires than 32 bit wire. so if you have 64 bits to send or 32 bit uh on 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 a wire that has the two strands that means you need to uh break that 64 bit into two 32 so we now can say that it will take it will take less, uh, it, will, it, will, it will run slower. Uh, while if you send 64 at a go, it will go faster. So that's just the idea you should have. Now, so, but to make sure that 64 bit architecture uh, can work with um, um, 86, S86, 
um, 64 bit window operating system, also they have that backward compatibility. Now, to be able to run on some S86 uh, architecture. Now, uh, processor, uh, I mean, the process much more complex instruction at a much higher rate. Okay, 64 bits of NCM running on a 64 x64 uh, processor, they process much more complex instruction at a much higher rate. Now let's look at the example here. The example we have here, let me not allow it to cover. The example we have here, uh, as we look at the old, the earlier release operating system. We're looking at 32 bits and 64 bit compatibility in Windows operating system. Don't forget we have talked about Linux, Unix, uh, Mac OS. Well, actually focusing on Windows here because Windows seems to be popular and a few other, um, and, and uh, especially in our part of the world. But some of us still use Linux. We use uh, uh, Ubuntu, we use um, Red Hat Linux, we use Mandrivers, and uh, just to get some uh, technical work done, like setting up servers, uh, like managing um, um, content, you know, management, and all that. Now, uh, you can also use it to do your routing uh, configuration. Now, uh, we, we have um, in this table, we have 32 bits, 64 bits. So look at window seven starter. Uh, it's, it's only 32 bits. When you see the Mac, it means it can, only, it can support only 32 bits. Windows 7 Home Premium can support both 32 and 64 bit. Windows 7 Professional can support 32 and 64 bit. Windows 7 Ultimate can support 32 and 64 bit. Windows Window Vista Home Basic can support 32 and 64. Windows Vista Home Premium 32 and 64. Window uh, Vista Business support 32 and 64. Window Vista Ultimate 32 64-bit. Windows XP Professional can support 32 64-bit. While Windows XP Home can support only 32-bit. While Windows XP Media Center can also support 32 So when you're choosing a system, you really look at what you are uh, what you are after. The same thing with Windows 8. Windows 8. They have this different, we have Windows 8 uh, Professional, Windows 8 Pro, Windows 8 Ultimate and all that, uh, or Enterprise, sorry, Enterprise. So all these, uh, they can support 64 bits and 32 bits if you, but specifically you will see them having uh, either 64 bit in, in bracket, there should be so sure that they can only uh, function in that uh, mode. Now, let's look at types of operating system. Uh, having done this, we look at types of which system. We have desktop operating system and network operating system. Okay, this is what we talk about multi user and uh, and single user. So desktop systems they are normally single user, uh, all the ones we see on uh, Windows uh, 7, 8, 9, 10, uh, that are installed on just desktop or laptops, they can be in single user. So they run a single user application, supports single user, share files and folders, they share peripherals, they also use a small can, they can use, can be used on a small network. 
Network Robinson CM actually they support multiple users. That's why they are called network. The main, the main, the main, the main uh, reason is to support multiple users. Then they run multi-user applications. Uh, now they can also reduce uh, uh, the number of uh, hardware that you replicate that you buy. So they can they can centralize management of a lot of things uh, with server client scenario. Now you also have uh, they also have robust and uh, they, that means they are they are they are when you say robust that means they they, they are strong um, and uh, they also have redundancy that means they cannot easily um, you know break down they have uh when one part fails another one can take over okay, that's what we call redundancy and that means they can have uh two or three power supplies so that if one power supply goes down the other one takes over they can have you know all these provisions then we have they also provide uh Network open systems can also provide increased security. Very, very important to network open system. Increased security because to secure each user's account. And they also use on a network, a network. So you can have a local area network, you can have a, a campus area network, you can have a, a, a you know, metropolitan area network, and then you can have the um, the what we call the uh, uh, global area network. That means uh, you have uh, the internet that we are uh, referring to now. Now, types of operating system. We have desktop, as we said. Example: Windows XP. I mean, Windows uh, Microsoft Window, Windows Seven XP, and all that. Then we have Macintosh, Macintosh, uh, Mac OS. X version, but uh, then we have Linux, we have Unix, they can run as desktop operation. We have other than Linux, we have uh, Ubuntu, Mandriva, and all the rest. Then when you have a desktop operating system, you should be watching out for the following categories. Support single user, run single user application, shares file and folders on a small network with limited security. Not only that, um they also allow um you to create your user account so that you can protect your system with a password so they are limited security they have limited security that's what we've seen now network operating system the common network operating system includes microsoft windows server starting from uh windows nt then we have Windows Server series, you know, uh, Windows NT, uh, I think uh, we have uh, Windows NT 4.0, 5.0, then Windows Server 2000, 2001, I mean, I think 2002 or whatever about. Then now we're having, um, you know, current Windows servers, you can just search the net for that. Now uh, we have uh, we have Linux. They are noted for that. We have Linux. Um, we have uh, Unix. Uh, we have uh, Mac OS servers too. So for that uh, network operating system. We also have um, we also have the following characteristics for network operating system. They support multi-user, run multi-user application. The robust and redundant provides increased security compared to desktop desktop operating system. Okay. Now let's look at customer requirement for an operating system. Now this is what majority of people will be looking for if you are supporting. You want to recommend Princeton for your users. This is what you should be looking for. 
um, you're supporting yes um, uh, sorry I want to quickly talk about Microsoft Windows servers now we have Windows servers uh, uh, 2012 2016 2019 like that they are available now and uh, it's uh, it is part of uh, what you can have available for your uh, networking. Uh, okay, when it's about twenty twenty also seems to have been released, and uh, uh, this is going to be the successor. When it's about twenty twenty will be the successor for Windows Server 2019. And uh, it is, it, uh, it was released on May 19, 2020. And uh, it's bonded with Windows 2020 and uh, has Windows 10 features, okay? So that is the current state of Microsoft Windows Server. Uh, Linux also, they have, you know, we have periods, we have, um, uh, Red Hat Linux, we have uh, Mandriva Linux, we have Ubuntu, we have uh, all of that. And Unix, uh, and uh, we have Mac, Mac OS. So they have all this. So quickly, I move to customer requirement for an OS. To select the proper operating system for customer, first, you have to determine the budget constraint, how much money does the customer have, compatibility with current hardware, the system that the person has or the system he can afford to buy, compatible with new hardware, how the computer will be used, what are the packages I think I will run on that because some uh, graphic intensive, you know, applications like AutoCAD, like, um, you know, Corel Draw and other things will need uh, better better hardware like uh, you know graphic processing units and uh, gpu and good rams and all that compatibility with existing applications so all these things will be important types of new applications will be used on that operating system because it is operating system that you run on that hardware that will be able to provide a layer for your applications to run on on. So you also, customer may need to upgrade or purchase additional hardware to support the required operations and the operating system. We need to do cost analysis with which will indicate if purchasing new equipment is a better idea than upgrading. Okay, these are things we put into consideration when we are recommending an upgrade or getting a new system. If the cost implication of upgrading is higher than getting a new system we recommend getting a new system a new laptop a new desktop whatever or even server now possible hardware upgrades you can upgrade your ram capacity in case the applications need more ram hard, hard drive size can be you know increased through upgrades cpu also can be upgraded Video card memory and speed can be upgraded. Motherboard can also be upgraded for better, um, you know, features and uh, addresses and um, all the other features uh, we have on the uh, in the system. So for Windows Seven Professional, one gigahertz or faster, thirty-two bit. Uh, that is x64 x or 64 bit so you have one gig one gig ram for a two bit one gig ram uh 64 bit hmm. i think uh, this may be a uh, you may need this will be the minimum okay minimum because one gig now is uh, most but for Windows 8, you need four 
gig minimum. Windows 8, Windows 10, you need at least four gig RAM as minimum. Uh, so that's the situation now. Now, most of them have what we call hardware compatibility list. You have to check the manufacturer website for that. Hardware compatibility list. That means these are the hardware that this operating system supports that can be installed on them and that it can work comfortably, comfortably with. So you can also use Microsoft Compatibility Center for Windows 7 and Vista, Windows 8 and Windows 10. So you can get them there. Now, Open System upgrades. You can upgrade Open System when due, when needed. When you want to remain uh, compatible with latest hardware and software, you may need to upgrade your operating system. Because some applications run better with Windows 10 than Windows 8. In fact, support for some of the operating system that have like uh, Windows, uh, you know, 7, uh, seem to have been discontinued. So you may, if you have any issue, you may not be able to have support for them. So that's why you may need to upgrade. So because support for other OSS will eventually be withdrawn. And that will create bottleneck if you are developing, um, you know, probably applications that you are doing some things that need constant uh, uh, upgrades, constant, you know, uh, I mean, constant uh, compatibility with new features. So it's when you upgrade open system, it's ensure that new OS is compatible with the computer. So ensure that uh, you can use Microsoft Upgrade Advisor to do that, so that you'll be able to, to do the upgrade. Because you cannot upgrade a, 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 three, a, a laptop or a system with 386 processor to Windows 10, it won't, it won't, it won't happen. It can. Or you say maybe a 486 system or even a 586 system uh, to run Windows 10. You know, say a 586 system, uh, Pentium, you know, say Pentium 4 system, you know, that to run, uh, to run Windows 10. The Pentium 4, it just has maybe about one gig RAM. It won't, it won't, it won't support it. So these are the things you need to watch out for. So, but then you need to go use Microsoft Upgrade Advisor on the net, so that you can have a a a, 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 a an overview of what you will expect. So before you can upgrade, you need to back up all data prior to beginning the upgrade, and this is very very important. Uh, and these are the up, up, OS you can upgrade to. You want to upgrade to Windows 98. Uh, you want to upgrade uh, Windows 98 to Windows 20 2000, which is supported. You want to upgrade Windows 98 to Windows SP, it's supported. You want to upgrade Windows 98 to Windows Vista, it's supported. But you cannot upgrade Windows 98 to Windows 7. It's not supported. That's what he's saying in this table. Windows 2000, where you cannot, you cannot upgrade Windows 7 to Windows 2000. So there's, there's not available because it's still Windows 2000. But you can upgrade Windows 2000 to Windows SP. You can upgrade Windows 2000 to Windows Vista. But you can't upgrade Windows 2000 to Windows 7. And that means you cannot, or you cannot also upgrade to Windows 8 and Windows 10. The same thing with Windows 98. So Windows 98, uh, Um, then Windows uh, Vista. Um, uh, Windows Vista not available. You cannot upgrade Windows Vista to Windows 2000, to Windows XP, to, but you can upgrade Windows Vista to Windows 7. And from the Windows 7, I think you can upgrade to Windows 8 from Windows 7. And to Windows 10, but uh, most of the time we recommend complete uh, 
new installation to take advantage of uh, all the things. Now, there are data migration tools provided if you want to do upgrade. We have user state migration tools, which can migrate all user files and uh, settings to the new operating system. We have window easy transfer to migrate your personal files and settings when switching from an old computer to the new. These are the early days of Windows XP and all that. Uh, in, and uh, they also should be available in the new Windows versions, Windows 10, Windows 8, and Windows 10. Now, installing the operating system, reason to perform a clean installation of an OS, reason to perform a clean installation of an OS. These are the reasons you may want to consider. When a computer is passed from one employee to another, we need to perform a clean installation so that there will be no uh, transfer of files to that individual, to the new uh, employee. When the operating system is corrupted, it will need clean installation so that it will not continue to have that corrupt. You know, corruption can be as a result of um, virus, Trojan, or whatever. When the primary hard drive is replaced in a computer, then you need to perform a clean installation manual of the operating system. When you probably buy a new hard drive or the current hard drive crashes and it is now unusable. So you may need to replace it. So you need to perform clean installation. Now, that is against the uh, upgrade. Now, before performing a clean up installation, number one, back up all data first. Then explain to the customer that existing data will be erased. And so, so that you can back up all the data that are necessary, that are still useful, and are still needed. Then confirm that all needed data has been successfully transferred or backed up. If you do a clean installation, take note that you will not have your data back on that hard drive. So you need to do backup. Copy the data from that hard drive to another hard drive before you do a clean installation. Now, hard drive setup procedure, operating system setup methods. What are you to do here? You can install an operating system over a network from a server, it's possible. You can install operating system files stored on CD you can install from open system files sold on CD or DVD, which we normally do regularly because uh, that is very easy. You can easily get the DVD, you can easily get the CD. Now, you need to do what you call partitioning and formatting. Now, we'll be doing this in more in the lab, you know, but you need to know that hard drives must be logically divided into partitions. And then I look at partitions as a way of you know creating boundary creating boundary for instance as i normally explained when you go to a piece of land and you need to be able to say okay these are my boundary want to want to build you want to buy a new piece of land or you want to even farm a piece of land you need to be able to define the boundary this is the boundary. So partitioning a, a, a hard drive actually creates boundary. And you can partition a single hard drive into two, three, or four. You are creating boundaries that we define uh, logical you know, area that can be used independently. Then after your partition, you have to do file, you have to create uh, the type of file system through using, I mean, through using formatting. So formatting will do that. Formatting is to create consecutive circles of tracks, amen, 
During the installation phase, most of the will automatically partition and format the hard drive. Thank you. I will stop at this point. See you next time. We'll continue from here in the next uh, video, next lecture. Thank you. Bye-bye.